What a great thought, huh? What a great thought. Amen. Well, there's one thing about the gospel of Jesus Christ is uh, there is hope. Yeah, there's hope. We get answers. We get answers about important issues for the past and to deal with the present and for the future. Amen. Answers like uh, the gospel gives are more than what evolution can give. Thank the Lord for that. Yeah. I appreciate the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of redemption. Amen. Let's bow in prayer for a moment. Thank you, Lord, for this good day. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, sing and pray, speak the word, come to an understanding together of the great plan of redemption, of our God, creator of all things, who made uh, heaven and earth and all that is in it, and who has a plan for humanity. Praise God. And now, Lord, bless our time together while we uh, sit here as we think about the things that are before us, as we celebrate uh, the Easter time, the resurrection, the conquering of death by the Savior. Praise God. Now, in all things, we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, well. Okay, we've been uh, discussing the matter of prayer for a little while now, a few lessons, and we'll continue on in this matter of prayer because it's like we were saying at other times, uh, a lot of people give a lot of attention to the need for communication, but they don't really get involved in learning how this is carried out. And so prayer is conversation with God. Prayer is communications with God. It's our connection. And so there's more in it than just a quick little, hi, how are you? I'm me and I need this. And away we go. A whole bunch more than that. We need to understand that this is communication with God. And because it's God, because it's uh, the master, then this is prayer time is sacred time. We don't often consider prayer sacred, but it is. It is. And we need to make it that way if we don't. All right, let's, uh, I want to pick up reading here. And um, in your Bible, the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 13, our trip to Nevada went well and uh, enjoyed the time with my folks. They're up in years now and both ailing physically and mom's sight is uh, mostly gone so that complicates matters. So if you think of them, uh, have a prayer for them, ask God to uh, lead them, guide them, guard them, watch over them. Help them in their ministry with the people there. Good journey, though, to visit the family. Lots of needs. I was, I was so overwhelmed with the need of the people. They're just dead and dying all around. We were able to help uh, Dad and Mom with a funeral while we were there. Gave them assistance with music and support. But, uh, man, our people are falling apart. Our relatives are... In such bad shape, it was uh, quite uh, overwhelming. See cousins and brothers and nephews and nieces and just death and dying everywhere. So they need God. They need help. They need the healer. They need the plan of salvation to come. Important. Luke chapter 11. For a while we'll think on this matter of praying in the will of God. Praying in the will of God. 
Luke chapter 11, and um, skip down to the 13th verse. Luke 11, 13. Now remember, this uh, particular account here is where the disciples had asked the Savior, uh, teach us to pray, teach us to pray. And so he gave them a lesson in prayer. And the, uh, the final point of the lesson we'll find in verse 13. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? There's the point of the message. Give me your spirit, Lord. Give me your spirit. There's, it's not bad to ask for everything else. It's just that everything else is overshadowed by this one particular need right here. Give us your spirit. Give us your spirit. The presence of God is where the work is, how the work is accomplished. The spirit of God is the power of God on earth. That's how the work is done. Anything that is done in you for good is accomplished by the Holy Spirit. And that's a point, a point we need to really understand. And that is a point of prayer here. Our communication is with God is for the intent of bringing us closer together with God. That's, right. that's the whole idea of communicating with God, to draw up closer to Him. Not yell across the canyon, Hey God, how are you doing today? I need such and such. It isn't like that at all. Communication with God is to draw us closer to Him. To be one in Him. Jesus prayed that way in His prayer. He said, Father, make these to be one with me as I am with you. That's the whole idea of prayer here. So if you understand what prayer, the focal of prayer is, then you understand that your prayer, that you're praying... Well, you got some needs in mind. God's also got some needs in mind. Remember something about God. He's always got, always has a plan. God always has a plan for you, for the human being. So every pray you prayer is communication with God, the one who has a plan. He's got a plan for that need that you're worried about. He's got a plan for you, and he's got a plan for your heart. That's the focal point here that we need to draw closer to. He's got a plan for you, for your own heart. So, the outstanding need of Christians in the world we live in today is have the presence of God in your heart. That's the greatest need we have. The presence of God in our heart was what we've got to uh, understand and be desiring and wanting and just how it is. We could uh, stop right there and say, go think about that. But that's the, that's the focal point. The presence of God. Every believer saved by God's mercy and grace. Every believer saved by God's mercy and grace should be asking, give me your spirit. Give me your spirit. Give me your spirit. Oh, God, give me your spirit. Amen. If, uh, if the Lord were to walk in through the door here this morning and we could recognize who he was, I would sit down immediately and let him go to work. I've got nothing to say when the Lord is uh, on the scene. But since he gives us his spirit, then he expects us, under the power of his spirit, to do the talking. And the listening. And the believing. Amen. The presence of God. We continually miss the point of prayer, mostly because we were taught to pray asking for something. Not only taught to pray asking for something. We were taught to pray asking for something to do with our earthly life, mostly. That's not bad. I'm not going to say that's bad. I'm not going to say quit doing that. It isn't. It's just that it's not the 
point of prayer that the Lord wants to get across to us. The only thing. He's trying to draw us closer up to him. Why? Is because that's where we are most protected. That's where we are most fulfilled. That's where we are most in line with God and his plan. Have you ever watched uh, a mother hen with chicks? You ever watch that? It's, it's fun, comical, and inspiring. If something, if anything looks like a threat, boy, I'll tell you what, she goes right to work. Pull them in here, a clucking and uh, getting them to go with her wherever it is she's going. She keeps a close watch to bring them close, get them in here. Amen. Yeah, well, one time, uh, and most m mothers of the animal kingdom, that's how they are. We were in Alaska on a trip, and our children were on a four-wheeler at the place we were visiting. They were on a four-wheeler and motoring down one of the little dirt roads there on the property. And a mother moose with a calf was on the scene. And uh, I don't remember exactly what the kid said, but uh, that mother moose was not happy. That mother moose was very unhappy with the intrusion. One of the more dangerous situations in the wild, if you understand, if you know animals, a mother moose with a baby moose. Get out of there. Get away. Yeah, get away, because you're in trouble. <laughs> you may not know it. That mother moose is going to look after that little one, bring him, that little one right up close. And that's the whole idea here of our God. He's trying to draw us up close. That's the safest place. That's, right. that's the safest place. That's the most enlightened place. Is to have God in your heart. The healer, the keeper, the teacher, the counselor. The guide, the guard, all of those. You got a lot of people over here uh, pursuing issues. Uh, it's great, but that's where they're lost also. A lot of our persuasions, preachers have gotten lost teaching the culture instead of connecting with God. Teaching the culture is what they've done. Maybe I should say what we've done. I've done that myself. Help us, Lord. Praying is so often maneuvering. Praying has become often a maneuvering process. It goes something like this. If I get close enough to God, then he will affect something for me. We don't say that. We use a lot of other language. But it all means kind of the same thing. If I get close enough to God, then he will do for me what I need done. Yeah, I don't know if any of you um, uh, noted in the Facebook postings this little three-year-old kid that was arguing with his, uh, I don't know if it was, anyway, it was his guardian. I don't know if it was mom or aunt or something. Maybe it was his auntie, a little three-year-old. He was arguing with her about, he wanted another role, I think it was. And she said, and she was telling him, no. And uh, he just wouldn't listen to anything she had to say. He just argued the point. He says, wait, 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 listen, listen, listen. And, that was, and he kept that up for these few minutes that I was, uh, I said, man, I'm glad that wasn't my kid. <laughs> yeah, the, the argument's over when we already said, you know, no more role. No more role. You had one already. No more role. That's it. It's done. But this, this guy didn't accept that. He just, he just argued on it. It was cute and funny, but uh, also it was kind of an eye opener too. So much of our praying is maneuvering. That little kid was maneuvering. And a lot of our praying is maneuvering. Yeah, we're overwhelmed with our needs. That's not bad. That's how it is. But you've got to remember something. God has a plan. When we come to God in prayer, God has a plan. God has a plan for us. 
One that knows all, sees all, because he created it all, has a plan for it all. And it's up to us to find what that is and uh, get a hold of that. Um, so then, praying so often, maneuvering our way to get close enough to God so that he will affect something for us here on earth or for someone else here on earth of an earthly nature. I keep repeating, that's not bad. That's not bad. But don't get lost in it. Understand the point of God. Understand the plan of God for you is for God to draw you close to Him. You draw up close to God. Know the Lord. Quit arguing about a lot of other features and factors. Get up close to God. Know Him. Maybe it's, uh, there's a reason though that that doesn't happen a lot of the times. We'll get to it. That's not bad to uh, be asking for your needs or for someone else unless we get stranded in that way of thinking and seeking. And if we do, then we neglect seeking to be close to the Lord and be filled with His Spirit. Can't neglect that. You can't neglect that. We cannot see deep inside our own heart. One of the things about us. We're unfathomable. What does that mean? That means you can't see past a certain point in your own heart. You can only see the extension, the expression of what's going on. You can't see inside your heart. So you don't know what's lurking there. And at times when you do see it, a lot of times people slam the door shut. If I'd have opened the door and saw a baseball-sized spider, I slam the door shut. <laughs> I was in Haiti for a visit one time and the missionary said, hey, we know how to scare up spiders from out of the ground. And uh, I had seen a dead one there in, uh, next to one of the buildings in the corner. That dead one was about this big. The dead one, he was kind of shriveled up there in the corner, but had he been alive, he'd have been good size. And I thought, man, we're going to scare spiders up out of the dirt like that? But when you look out on the yard, you don't really see them. They're just kind of a nice yard grass. But they says, here, here we gotta, you got to find a hole first, and then you pour water down the hole. Know, whatever it is they pour down there. And it scares them up, and you got to be ready. you got to be ready to catch them when they come up, put something over them. So we went out there, and they scared one up. Scared one up. Boy, he come crawling out of there. Yeah. And looking around. And they tried to help him. They waited till he got out and then put some, dropped something over on top of him. Catch him. I thought, wow, isn't that something? Now, you got that in mind. <laughs> the presence of the Lord will always shine light deep in your heart. Beyond what you can see beyond what you can really understand and fathom. And when you call the Lord in, when you call the Lord in, He's going to come and He's going to scare big old spiders up out of there. <laughs> so to speak. That's what the Lord does. How on earth is He supposed to accomplish this matter? There's a strong word in scriptures we run across it. Perfection. Man, that's a big word. Real big. But how are we supposed to perfect this holiness? We can't. We cannot by ourselves. We cannot by ourselves. We must have the Holy Spirit in our heart working on this. For God to be in us, His presence here and now experienced in real time and reality means for every need and problem to be taken care of. Possibly. You see? That's a, that's a strong thought there. You have to kind of think about it a moment. Uh, what do you mean? All right. If the presence of God is a here and now in real time reality, then 
every problem is potentially taken care of. If he wants to do it, everything. Your sore toe, your headache, your lack of money, your wayward kid, anything. God can corral wayward children, put them in circumstances so deep they'll be crying to get out. How do I know that? Because my parents prayed a prayer like that and got me in a circumstance I wanted no part of anymore. God knows us and he knows our need. Every problem and need will probably not be taken care of, but he could. The presence of the Lord is a bright light, folks. In the beginning, when God put it all together, one of the classic words from Scripture is, let there be light, let there be light. Various other places in Scripture, it says, God is light, in Him is no darkness. God is light. I am the way, the truth, the life, the light, the light, the light. The presence of God is light. Always remember that. The presence of God is going to shine light. Is going to reveal to you more of who you are. More of what you are. This is the problem that a lot of people had with Jesus when he walked the earth. Was that he would say things that made them realize that they had some problems. And they didn't like that. And he was pretty clear about a lot of these things. And these people, they rose up and said, man, we got to get this guy out of here. He's ruining our business. We got to get rid of this guy. He's making us feel bad. And therein, therein is the issue of drawing up close to God. That's what happens. The closer you get in fellowship together in marriage, the more you learn about one another. You want to get closer, reveal more of yourself. You want to have a close relationship with your mate? Start opening up your mind. Start opening up your heart. Start opening up your ways for revelation, for understanding, for insight to your mate. I, heard, I read something here recently. I thought it was kind of cute. It says, uh, you want your mate to listen to you with rapt attention and uh, just spellbound by what you're saying? And uh, the writer says, talk in your sleep. One of my preacher friends, he was saying one time he was sleeping, talking in his sleep. And uh, he says, hey, you look good in that. He was sleeping, sleep talking. I probably said it a little different than what he did, but he says, uh, you look good in that. And his wife says, uh, says his name and says, uh, who looks good in that? And his, uh, this guy, he says, one of his preacher brothers, he, he was answering her in his sleep. And he brought up the name of a preacher brother uh, wearing a new suit. You know, and, <laughs> and she probably was, oh, man. Yeah. You have to talk in your sleep. You'll get some real attention. <laughs> You want to get close? You're going to have to surrender autonomy. You want to be close to God? You're going to have to surrender your autonomy. Way down below what you're used to sharing and opening up and letting go. We were discussing that one of our friends' his children got married yesterday. Some of you know uh, Ethan Carey Crouch. Their oldest son got married yesterday. And our daughter, she says, well, I guess, uh, does that mean it's the uh, say goodbye to freedom? <laughs> I said, yeah, something like that. Surrender autonomy. Yeah. Now, this matter of prayer here, you want to really get through to God and you want to touch God and you want God to come and visit you, you're going to have to open up here and surrender. You're right to yourself. You want to get closer to God, you'll have to surrender your right to yourself. That's how we get closer to God. Amen. 
That's what prayer is about. You thought it was just a quick, hi, good morning, how are you, Lord? I need your guidance and protection today. Watch over me on the highway, help me at work, Lord. I need some money too. And uh, Lord, talk to you later, off we go. You haven't got close to anybody. Not every prayer is a prayer of intimacy. I realize that. But I want you to know something. Every prayer should be communications with God, which is sacred, which means when you talk to God, He can see things in you, and He can do things for you and in you that nobody else can do. Amen. Remember, to be submitted to God means to be submitted to His plan. To be submitted to God means to be submitted to His plan for you. Amen. Are you submitted to God's plan for you? In uh, which some may say, well, I don't even know what His plan is. How come? Well, I guess I haven't heard it. Okay. Any variation of that means this. You need to get closer to the Lord. You need to get closer to the Lord. How do you do that? How can I do that? I want to do that. He says, God will give you his spirit if you'll ask him. The presence of the Holy Spirit is God's presence. The Holy Ghost is not just some separated entity on his own from God. The Holy Spirit is God's presence. Here on earth, in your heart, if you ask Him to give you His Spirit. This is an important thing to understand. We won't get it all on one round here, but that's the direction we want to go. Amen. Our prayer may not be in alignment with His plan for us. And that's where we got to bring ourselves into some kind of a corrective mode here. If you understand that it's connection and communication with God, and if you understand that God has a plan, then you can better understand this. To push what you want will stall what God is working on in you and for you. Amen. I have a certain amount of... Uh, plan and design in mind for you as a group. Remember, that's only man's mind talking. I do the best I can to seek for the direction of the Lord to give you what you need. And try to understand what God wants. One of the misleading perceptions of our persuasion is that we are in charge of our holiness. It's a misconception. It's a twist of perception that we're in charge of our holiness. Um, that leads to fascination and preoccupation with our personal holiness, which means we got all kinds of attention on self now. Anytime, anytime you bring undue attention on self and keep it there, you become self-centered. I don't care how holy you think you are. When you get too self-centered, you begin to cause problems. You begin to be a problem. Help us, Lord. If we could see close enough, if we could see clear enough the plan of God for us, we would see that the main thing we can do is admit who we are, admit what we really are, and then ask God to come in. Ask God to come in. And deal with what we admitted that we are. You know something? I have relatives, I'll just say that, who are cleanies. You got any, anybody like that? Don't raise your hand, just kind of nod your head to yourself. You're a cleanie, which means anything that's laying, in, laying down where it's not supposed to be, you scoop it up and put it where it's supposed to go. I didn't say that was bad. That's okay. That's good. You see, you just, poof, there it is. You grab it up and scoop it there. Some of us, we have this compulsive thing about things not being lined up. Books on a table. If you watch me back here, you see all my books are in a line. They're all sitting. They all take up only so much space. 
I don't call that a good trait. It's just a kind of one of those things you do, compulsive things. Well, you get people that are like that compulsive cleaning. You know, if there's a shoe not lined up exactly, you know, they just put them together and stick them there. And they just go right down the line. They'll just clean up everything in no time. That's not bad, but that's good. But that's just kind of how it is. Now, God, if you open up and let him into your heart, he's like... Uh, like somebody, you know, in a place, they turn the light on, and they shine it everywhere. And when you let God in, he clicks the light on on everything that needs work. Everything. When you bring the Lord in, he'll begin to go to work on everything that needs straightened up, just like a cleaning. He just goes right to work because it's his plan. It's his design. Why? He said, that's the problem that under the right set of circumstances is going to get you in trouble. Problems that God sees at the deep level are the issues that are going to bring you down unless they're attended to. Now, take Jacob, for instance. I've heard preachers preach whole messages on Jacob, great messages, wonderful messages, searching messages, soul-searching messages. And it's good. That's what we need. Jacob, he, uh, he deceived his brother, and then he ran off with the blessing. He went away to a faraway country, and uh, then he got kind of beat up over there too. It took him a long time, but one day he was coming back. And as he was coming back, he started having a problem with coming back. He had a problem with him. He thought, he got to thinking, just, you know, I deceived that brother of mine and now I'm going to see him and he's a big burly guy and I'm in trouble. And uh, he was uh, just wrestling. He wrestled with the angel one night. Wrestling. Some say he was wrestling with himself. Uh, whatever, he was wrestling. Got up the next day, he was still brooding over this issue. And in that wrestling match, the angel said, uh, what's your name? What's your name? Well, he knew, he knew what the problem was. When God shines the light, when God comes in and goes to work and shines the light, and he says, uh, What's this? You know that he knows. You might as well admit what he knows. And Jacob said, my name's Jacob. Deceiver. I'm a deceiver. I'm a deceiver. And the wrestling match was over. The angel said, you got a new name. You're going to be a different person here. You got to be. But that's not going to happen until the light comes on and you admit to your real self. And this is why God's got to come in, folks. This is why we've got to invite him in because these are things we're not going to see ourselves and we're not going to own up to ourselves. We're going to have to get to the place to where we open up, let God come in. Now, when we open up and admit who we are and God comes in, guess what? It's God that does the work of changing. You know, we learned, us holiness people, we learned to wrestle and cry and scream and writhe and pound and everything else when we're praying for God to come in. When it's really a simple matter of the individual saying, this is who I am. I'm, I'm lost in self-preservation, Lord. I'm just so worried and fearful. I'm just lost in preserving myself, my family, my home, my income, my cars, my chickens, my horses, my pigs, my guns, my money. I'm lost in self-preservation. I'm fearful. That's who I am. Or, Lord, I'm insecure. I'm insecure. I'm fearful. I don't want to get close to people. They're going to hurt me. I've been hurt before. I've been wounded. I'm insecure down deep. 
That's who I am, Lord. Or, like Jacob, I'm a deceiver. I'm a deceiver. I'm deceitful. I craft everything. I maneuver everything. I change everything around to fit me. Yeah, I'm a deceiver. You know, it's a simple matter of admitting our status, our need, our problem. And when the Lord comes in, he's the one that does the changing. We don't change anything. The Lord does the changing. We do the inviting. We do the admitting. Amen. Have you prayed the prayer? Father, give me your spirit. Are you praying that prayer? Give me your spirit, Lord. Give me your spirit, Lord. I've been a, I've been a self-preservationist looking out for myself. Self-sufficient. I'm fearful of losing it all. I've got to do what I can do. I'm not giving license for irresponsibility here, folks. That's not it at all. Any of that. We just got to get to the place to where we can open up and say, give me your spirit, Lord. And then when he gives us his spirit, understand what it means. Understand what it means. When the Holy Spirit comes in, light comes in, and you see who you are. And if what you are is not God's spirit, then tell the Lord what you are. So he can give you his spirit to take over and in fullness do what needs done. He will clean it for you. You know that? You realize that? This matter of being given the Holy Spirit is the completion part of this plan. In that great day when God lifts his spirit from the earth. That day's coming, you realize? That day's coming. He's going to pull his spirit from the world. The world will plunge into a darkness unfathomable by anybody. And an evil and a destruction. You want to be filled with his spirit when the time comes that he pulls his spirit from the world. Amen. So, let's go home and think about that. Praying, Father, give me your spirit. Amen. Let's stand.